everybody and welcome to the Gospel Minute Live. I'm Steve Toby and today is, uh, wow, let me tell you, it's Pascha. Christ is risen, truly, he is risen, amen. And uh, tonight we're going to, uh, this is our Sunday night edition, we're going to uh, recap what's happened in the past week. And we're going to do it through the uh, um, through the uh, perspective of a, a Coptic priest. Now, why Coptic? Why not get an Orthodox priest? Well, you know, we have uh, a couple of Coptic uh, Christians in our prayer group. Steady been here for a number of years. And uh, one of them, Joseph Khalil, sent me a, a uh, uh, link to a, a nice video, which we're going to play tonight. There's no theological differences or anything in here, so there's no problem. Um, we all know, or should know, that there's a couple of uh, sticking points between the Coptic uh, Orthodox Church, the Oriental Orthodox Church, and the Eastern Orthodox Church. And, uh, but this is a pretty, pretty good, very, very good uh, recap of what we have gone through in the past week. And uh, so we're going to do that, and then we're going to talk about the resurrection and the importance of the resurrection. So, before we do all that, let us, uh, let's go to Jonathan. This, there he is. Hello, Jonathan. Oh, I can't hear you. Why are you muted? Just a minute. Should be able to hear you now. Testing one. Oh, you're three. fine. You're fine. Okay. okay. I don't know why that Good evening, good. everyone. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Amen. Let us attend and pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who loves mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Implant also in us the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well-pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thine unoriginate Father and thine all-holy good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and in the ages of ages. Amen. Tonight's first reading is from Psalm 39, found on page 708 of your Orthodox Study Bible and 709. Psalm 39 is a prophecy of the Incarnation. His Incarnation, the Lord assumed a mortal body and a rational soul. And here, is, here the body is emphasized because man's body is mortal and subject to death and decay in the grave. So by his death in the body, Christ destroyed death. And by his resurrection, he overcame the decay that held men's body in the grave. He was able to do all this because of the two wills in his one person. For he willed by his human will and energy. And the phrase your will shows that he possessed within himself the same will and energy as God the Father. Because he is one in essence with him. Therefore, by means of his two wills and energies, he destroyed death and decay and put a new song in the mouth of the church. Psalm 39, for the end, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he heeded me, and he heard my supplication, and brought me out, up out of the miserable pit, and from miry clay, and he established my feet on a rock, and kept straight my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn to our God. Many will see and be afraid and shall hope in the Lord. Blessed is the man whose hope is in the name of the Lord and who did not look into vanities and false frenzies. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you perform. And in your thoughts there is no one who shall be likened unto you. I declared and said, 
They are multiplied beyond number. Sacrifice and offering you did not will, but a body you prepared for me, a whole burnt offering and a sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. It is written of me in the volume of the book. I willed to do your will, O my God, and your law in the midst of my heart. I proclaimed righteousness in the great church. Behold, I shall not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. I did not hide your righteousness in my heart. I declared your truth and your salvation. I did not hide your mercy and your truth from the great congregation. O Lord, do not remove your compassion from me. May your mercy and your truth take hold of me continually. For evils without number surround me surrounded me my transgressions overpowered me and i could not see they multiplied more than the hairs of my head and my heart failed me be pleased o lord to deliver me o lord give heed to my to help me may those who seek my soul to make a way with it be disgraced and confounded together may those who wish evil for me be turned back and disgraced May those who say to me, well done, well done, receive their shame immediately. May all who seek you, O Lord, rejoice exceedingly and be glad in you. And may those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy. The Lord will take care of me. You are my helper and my protector. O my God, do not delay. The word of our Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Any notes on that, Steve? No. No? Okay. Let's turn to our second reading, which is from Acts. Chapter 1. Or, yeah, chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. And uh, that's found on page 1469 of your Orthodox Study Bible. Um, there's a lot of notes, so let's just attend. From Passover to Pentecost, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, unto the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Day 1 through 39, Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with ba- with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of, and to the ends of the earth. The word of our Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our third reading is from the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. Found on page 1419 and 1421 of your Orthodox Study Bible. Let us attend the... Yeah, uh, let's go to the note. The note says, Only God has life in himself, thus the Word, being God, is the source of life together with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The life was the light of men. John now introduces mankind as a receiver of the divine light by participating in the life of the Son 
Believers themselves become children of the light. Moses saw the divine light in the burning bush. The whole nation saw it at the Red Sea. Isaiah saw it in heavenly vision, in his heavenly vision. And three apostles saw it at the transfiguration. John 1.1 1, 1. The Word is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Baptism, Baptists witness to the word. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for, for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the, the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh to reveal the Father. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The word of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, let's say hello to a few people. And uh, before we go on. <clears throat> okay. And there's Magnolia Shores. Good evening. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Robin Armstrong. Robin and Pippin, good evening. And Robin, I did get your email. And uh, Struvilla Baskos, Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Happy and blessed Easter, everyone. And thank you for all that you do for us, Steve. And thank you for all that you do for me, folks. May God bless you and your family and yours as well. Helen Stevens, God bless. And good evening, Steve, Kurt, Jonathan, Joe, Gary, Eric, Christina, Robin, Amy, Mother Elizabeth, and everyone else here. Amen. Christ is Amen. risen. Indeed, he is risen. And let me see here. Debbie Owen over there in Lyons, New York. Good evening to you. My mouse doesn't want to work for some reason. I hate it when that happens, but there we go. There we go. Karen Kalanovich. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Amen. We'll be hearing a lot of that over the next 50 days. And uh, Karen also goes on to say, praying our evening to get together is blessed and full of thanksgiving. Amen. <laughs> Joy and Manaski in Phoenix, good evening. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. A blessed Easter to everyone. Mary Saad, good evening. Truly he is risen. Anna Gennaro, Christos Aneste. And I can't Alistos read the rest. Christos Aneste. Nellie Card Valley, Christ is risen. Glorify him. Amen. Nellie, my little sister down in New York. Ruthie Johnson from Kentucky. Good evening. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Amen. Deborah Goodall, good evening. Christ is risen. And Amen. let me see here. Karen Kalanovich replies to Debbie. Truly, he is risen. And there's Gary Ballard. Good evening, everyone. Christ is risen. And uh, I, I just sent Gary, a, Gary, I just sent you an invitation. 
Maybe you didn't get the first one I sent, but I did. I really, really did. Okay, so, oh, over here. We got to go over here. Oh, my goodness. To the annex. They'll never forgive me over there if I forget them. There's Joe Barbera. Greetings all. Christ is risen. Juliet Sabunia, New Boston. Christ is risen. Bernie Grand. Good evening, Bernie. Christ is risen. Good evening, friends. Nick Salvador. Good evening. And uh, Cristo has resucitado. I think that's Spanish. That's the resucitado. Eh, good evening to you, Nick. Eleonora Shanera, Christ is risen. Blessed feast of Pascha. Good evening, Steve, Jonathan, and everyone. Blessings and much love to you all. And uh, now, Eleonora is from Louisville, Kentucky. And I don't know if everybody's heard on the news about the shootings in Alabama, where uh, four people were shot and another uh, killed, and another 20 were wounded at a sweet 16 birthday party of all places. And there was another uh, shooting, two people killed and four, four I think, uh, wounded in uh, Eleone's hometown of Louisville. So Lord, we pray for all of those who have been uh, murdered, who have, uh, Lord, who have been injured and wounded. We pray, dear Lord, that you have mercy on them. Amen. And Gary Ballard is doing double duties over here, too. He's going side to side. And oh. uh, there's Joseph Khalil. He has a re reading from Matthew chapter 4. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Amen. And, Joseph, good to see you. And Joseph sent me a link. Uh, for a YouTube video, and it's a nice, nice recap on what we have just gone through in the past week, as I said earlier. And uh, so, uh, now it's by a Coptic priest, but that's fine, that's fine. Um, so, I thank Joseph for sending me that, and now, what do you say, we sit back and watch that nice, nice video that Joseph sent me. And let me see if I can find it get to it and uh, Jonathan you can go to Facebook or YouTube to watch it in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit one God Amen in this video we're going to follow in Christ's footsteps from the time he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday all the way through to bright Saturday you can use the chapters in the timeline of the video or the timestamps in the description to skip to a specific day in case you want to refresh your memory on what happens on each day of Holy Week. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem triumphantly, fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 9.9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. As he drew near, the crowds chanted, Hosanna to the son of David, and blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees asked Jesus to rebuke the crowd, but he replied that even the stones would cry out if the people were silent. Jesus chose to ride a donkey, symbolizing him as a ruler of a renewed covenant. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem marked the beginning of his journey to fulfill the redemption leading to his death and resurrection. In the church on Palm Sunday, we do a procession in the morning where various readings are read at different stations around the church. The procession is identical to the one done on the Feast of the Cross, as the church is reminding us that even though there is a kingly procession on Palm Sunday. The way Christ will truly reign is on the cross. Also during the liturgy, we commemorate the entry into Jerusalem by reading the four Gospels, one for each evangelist's account of this event, so as to capture the full picture of the narrative. Finally, before everyone leaves the church that day, we pray the general funeral and sprinkle water which has been prayed on over the entire congregation. This is because if anyone passes away during Holy Week, there are no additional funeral prayers on the person as this week we only focus on the suffering of Christ. During Pascha, which is translated as Passover, the church is adorned with black as a sign of mourning. We are not mourning for Christ as stated in Luke chapter 23 verse 28, but rather we are mourning the consequence of our sins. During both the morning and evening Paschas, we chant the famous hymn Thok Tetigom, Thine is the power, the glory, and the majesty. 
Even though to the world the crucified Christ may seem weak and humiliated, we see Jesus on the cross as one with power, glory, and majesty. Each hour we chant the hymn 12 times, replacing the 12 Psalms in the Ikbeya hours. During the Holy Week, we don't pray the Psalms of the Ikbeya since they contain prophecies that will be fulfilled as we go along in the week. On Monday, Jesus cursed the fig tree with many leaves but no fruit, a stern warning about the danger of hypocrisy and that good and evil cannot coexist. As Adam and Eve covered their shamefulness with fig tree, Christ rebukes the fig tree to tell us that we can no longer cover our sins with a cloak of hypocrisy. Jesus then went into the temple and drove out those who bought and sold, overturning tables of money changers and sellers of doves. God had previously rebuked the Jews through the prophet Jeremiah for desecrating his house with idolatrous worship. Just like the fig tree, Christ is warning them against hypocrisy and wants his temple to be a place of worship and not a den of thieves, filled with business and corruption. The church encourages us not to think of this week as just an outer appearance of worship, but rather focus on sowing the virtues of repentance, love, and meekness. In preparation for the second coming, the church emphasizes the need to be watchful and ready. On Tuesday, Jesus returned to Jerusalem from Bethany and spoke to his disciples about faith. He also spoke with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and lawyers, exposing their hypocrisy and warning about the destruction of the temple and the persecution of his followers. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus taught his disciples about the signs of his coming and the importance of keeping watch through parables such as the ten virgins and the ten talents. He also revealed that he would be crucified during the Passover. At the end of the day, he went to rest in Bethany while the Jewish leaders plotted to kill him. These events serve as a reminder to remain vigilant in the faith and be prepared for the return of Christ. During the 11th hour of Tuesday morning, Bascha, we chant a long hymn known as Pekethronos, which is translated as, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Because in this hour's gospel, the Lord indicated the exact time He will suffer for us. For this reason, we also add the words, My good Savior, to the chant, Thine is the power, the glory, and the majesty. On Wednesday, Jesus chose to spend His time in Bethany, teaching His disciples and reassuring them that He would always be there for them. The Bible doesn't mention Jesus doing anything that day other than spending His time in solitude and seclusion, just as the Passover lamb rested before the day of its slaughter. Meanwhile, the church's readings that day focus on extreme love and extreme betrayal. We read about Mary of Bethany who sacrificed her livelihood to anoint Jesus for his burial with a precious perfume worth 300 denarii, which is nearly a year's worth of wages. Meanwhile, Judas, one of Christ's disciples who served with him for three years, betrays him for only 30 silver coins, the price of a slave. On the eve of Thursday, which is Wednesday night, during the third hour of the evening Pascha, the psalm of Chnon is sung in the long tune. It says, His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords, which is prophesying how one of Jesus' closest friends is the one who will betray him. We also remember Judas' betrayal with a kiss. So kisses and greetings are not exchanged from the eve of Wednesday, which is Tuesday night, until the end of the Divine Liturgy on Bright Saturday. On Holy Thursday, the Lord washes the disciples' feet before He institutes the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. The word Pascha means Passover. The Passover is God's promise to save His people, allowing them to pass from death to life. The first Passover involved the blood of a lamb placed on the doors of the Israelites, which led to their deliverance. The second Passover was the institution of the Eucharist by Christ, which is the ultimate fulfillment of the Passover. Christ became the true Passover lamb by offering His true body and His true blood in the form of bread and wine. The Eucharist is a true and living reminder of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and His love for us. On the eve of Good Friday, Christ talks to His disciples for the last time and prays for them. During the first hour of the eve of Good Friday, which is Thursday night, the church reads from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 33 to 1726. This is Christ's longest continuous prayer and it is a personal prayer from the Son to the Father. We see how the first Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, while the second Adam, which is Christ, submitted to God's will in the Garden of Gethsemane. Christ urges His disciples to stay awake and pray, as His betrayers are at hand. Finally, His betrayer Judas arrives, handing Him over to His enemies with a kiss. Christ is seized and His lengthy night of trials begin. From the eve of Good Friday, which is Thursday night, we add to Thine is the power, the Lord is my strength and my praise, and He has become to me a sacred salvation. This is a verse that is found in Psalm 118 verse 14. 
and highlights how the Lord has become our salvation, and that is through His cross. Also, from the eve of Good Friday until the end of Good Friday, the Church will read from the four Gospels during every hour of Pascha, detailing the events that happened during that time. On Good Friday, Jesus was condemned by the chief priests and delivered to Pilate to be killed. False witnesses came forth to accuse him. Judas, who betrayed him, later hung himself. St. John Chrysostom reminds us in the homily of the first hour how awful is the love of money. If the love of money possesses someone, it renders him captivated by it. See how many blessings the love of silver took away from Judas. The chief priests used the money to buy a potter's field to bury strangers in. Jesus was taken from the trial by the chief priest to stand in front of the Roman governor who was Pilate. Pilate, not wanting to deal with the situation, sent him to Herod after learning that Jesus was from Galilee. However, Herod ended up sending Christ back to Pilate. In the church, the icon of the crucifixion is hung with candles, censers, and rose petals are placed before it. In the third hour of Good Friday, Pilate the governor tries twice to release Jesus, but finally gives in to the will of the Jews, who choose instead to release Barabbas, a rebel and a murderer. Pilate washes his hands denying responsibility for Jesus' fate. Jesus is tormented and stripped by the soldiers. He is dressed in a scarlet robe, a crown of thorns is placed on his head, and a reed is placed in his hand. On the way to his crucifixion, they force Simon of Cyrene to bear the cross of Christ. St. Augustine makes an important observation that those who cried out that he should be crucified were the Lord's real crucifiers, rather than those who simply discharged their service to their chief according to their duty. We are called to repent and ask for mercy, recognizing the overflowing mercy of Jesus. Through his sacrifice, we obtain eternal life. In the sixth hour, the focus is on the cross, and there are several powerful readings and hymns that highlight its significance. The first prophecy discusses the symbol of the bronze serpent, representing the cross, crushing Satan and death. The second prophecy foreshadows Christ as the true and perfect Lamb of God, who was brought to the slaughter on Golgotha. We sing the hymn of Omonogenes, which has somber tone, but also promises hope through the resurrection. The church remembers the darkness that came over all the land when Christ died by turning off the lights. The hour concludes with the hymn Ari Pamevi, or Remember Me, O Lord, which is based on the words spoken by the thief on the right and celebrates the victory of the cross, which has redeemed all of mankind. In the ninth hour, we reflect on the powerful moment of Christ's death on the cross when he surrendered his soul to the Father and opened the door of paradise to all of humanity. Through Christ's sacrifice, death no longer enslaves those who die in him. Prophecies from Jeremiah and Zechariah foreshadow Christ's sacrifice and the spread of his kingdom throughout the world. In the church, the lights are turned on at the beginning of the gospel reading. The church also sings the hymn of the cross. The hymn is sung in the sixth and the ninth hour, and it says, This is he who offered himself up as an acceptable sacrifice on the cross for the salvation of our race. During the 11th hour, the soldiers were instructed to break the legs of those on the cross so that they die immediately. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs, already finding him dead. Instead, the soldier pierced the side of Jesus on the cross and blood and water came out. This is foretold in the scriptures when the sons of Israel sacrificed the Passover lamb, putting marks of its blood on their doors, they were instructed not to break any of the lamb's bones. The piercing of his side and water flowing reminds us of the water that poured out when Moses struck the rock in the desert, saving the lives of the people of Israel. We also see the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, showing that there is now reconciliation between the heavenly and the earthly. In the twelfth hour of Good Friday, we remember the burial of Jesus after he was taken down from the cross. The Romans usually left the crucified bodies on the crosses for birds to pray, while the Jewish people threw them in pits of garbage. However, Joseph of Arimathea requested to bury Jesus' body and along with Nicodemus prepared it with perfumes and pure linen. The prophecy for the twelfth hour comes from the Lamentations of Jeremiah, which depict the suffering of the cross and the grave. In this hour, for the second time this week, we sing the hymn Pekathronos, which is a psalm of praise saying, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Also, the veil of the sanctuary is opened, a burial reenactment takes place, and at the end of Good Friday, the 150 psalms are distributed among the congregation to be read, except for Psalm 151, which is to be read when everyone returns back to church for the bright Saturday service. Just as Passover is a joyous celebration of passing over from death to life, sin to holiness, and Hades to paradise, 
the church leads us on the same path from Good Friday to the Resurrection through Apocalypse Saturday, also known as Bright Saturday. The church is dressed in white as it spends the night with Christ in the tomb, as he goes down to Hades and brings up the souls of the righteous starting from Adam to Paradise. Having paid the debt that sent them there, we contemplate on the transitionary period from death to life with tunes that transition from the mournful Paschal tune to the standard and joyful tunes. In the church that night, we read praises from all over the Old Testament, and a number of processions are alternated between the praises. Also during the service, the church reads the book of Revelation. During the reading, the priests and the deacons surround seven oil lamps, which represent the seven churches who were before the throne of God. The night ends with the divine liturgy. In the liturgy, the hymn of Alleluia, this the day the Lord has made, is omitted, as well as the reconciliation prayer, since true reconciliation between God and man is fully completed after the resurrection. Finally, after following it in his suffering, we rejoice in his resurrection, just as St. Paul said, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. The resurrection is a message of hope for us all, reminding us that no matter how dark or difficult our circumstances may be, there is always hope for renewal and transformation in Christ. As we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, let us hold fast to that hope, living our lives with a renewed sense of purpose, knowing that we have been given the gift of eternal life through the sacrifice and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Happy Feast of Resurrection, Christos and I hit the wrong button and I stopped streaming there for just a couple of seconds. I hope everybody's still with us. And let's go see if we can bring back uh, our buddy here. There he is. Hello there, buddy. So it's a, nice yeah, film, a nice recap of what we have gone through in the, in the past week. And you know, um, the passion and the crucifixion are important. Yes, they but are. they mean nothing without the resurrection. Amen. They mean nothing with it. Let me read you a, a, a quote. Let me read you a note here from my study Bible. And, oh, i got to turn to that page. What page are we on? Well, we're going to go to page, uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to start at page 1569. And uh, I'm going to read a note of what we're about to read here. And it reads, what is Christianity without the resurrection? What is, res what is Christianity without the resurrection? Both Christ's and ours. His death does us no good without it. Let me repeat that. His death, the death of Jesus, does us no good without the resurrection. What use of for is forgiveness if we remain dead? His disciples were transformed by his resurrection, and this they preached above all. On Easter morning, Orthodox Christians sing, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. As uh, Karen Karlanovich reminded us this evening when she, re when she quoted that. So, and, you know, what, what good is repentance and all of that if there is no resurrection, if we are not resurrected, if we don't have life eternal with God, heck, we can go out and do anything we want. But the resurrection, Christ's resurrection, and we're going to read what St. Paul has to say about that in just a second. His resurrection, and the resurrection of Lazarus, by the way, and the resurrection, which we read uh, last Saturday, Lazarus Saturday, assuring us of Christ's resurrection and our own. And our own. Very, very important. So, well, we're going to read um, from verse, chapter 15. We're going to pick it up on verse 12. Okay, verse 12. Because I want to stick to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Mm -hmm. Okay, some people in that church in uh, Corinth believed that there was no resurrection from the dead. Some believed that it already had happened, as a matter of fact. And, um, well, if there's no resurrection, as I've already mentioned, and as our note tells us, if there is no resurrection, if there's no hope for uh, eternal life with God, why do we put ourselves through all of this? What does the man, what does the uh, uh, man say? I think it's the book of Acts. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Yeah. Tomorrow we die. So, um, but we don't eat, drink, and be merry. And, uh, because tomorrow we live, we live. But St. Paul goes on. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. And Paul tells us that. Without the resurrection, his preaching is empty. And our faith is empty. We've all wasted our time. Okay. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. That's pretty scary. Yeah, it is. It's terrifying. Yes, and we are found false false witnesses of God because false of, witnesses. because that, we that, what? that's one of the top 10 Steve bearing false witness is one of the top 10 yeah yes and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise for if the dead do not rise then Christ is not risen. No. And if Christ is not risen, your <laughs> faith is futile. You've wasted your time mm -hmm. if Christ has not been risen. Going on. Here's the scary part. Yeah. You are still in your sins. If Christ is not risen, you are still living in your sins. Amen. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Think of this. If there is no resurrection, okay, when you die, you will be dead. Spiritually and physically. Dead. No longer existing. But Christ promises life eternal. And I tend to believe anybody who has been resurrected from the dead. I, 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 have that, I have that inclination that if someone has been truly killed and died and has risen from the dead, I tend to place great credence in whatever he has to say. So, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, of all men, the most pitiful. Let me read that. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, of all men, the most pitiful. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is risen. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And there's a little note on that. Let me go down here. As the first fruits in the Old Testament were consecrated to God as the representative and promise of later fruits, so the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the first offering of the resurrection of all who are his. Amen. Amen. For since my man came, for since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. Yes spiritual death and physical death were brought about by man, Adam and Eve, falling away from God. 
Okay, remember uh, uh, and that interchange between Eve and uh, and uh, Satan, and uh, Eve says, you know, the Lord says, if I if we eat of this fruit, we shall surely die. What do you suppose he meant by surely die? Physically and spiritually. Okay, so man brought death into the world. Death was not in the equation. Go with the back through the first chapter of Genesis and, and show me where death is brought into this. No. We were created to live forever. Man destroyed that. That... Uh, that promise, that, that hope of eternal life. And it is through a man, Jesus Christ, that that is reinstated. We now will live forever spiritually and eventually physically. Given new bodies. Amen. For since by death came, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he, he was talking about his second coming there. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the son, of, uh, the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be in all, be all in all. What is this all under and under him and all of this? Where does this came at? Well, we actually talked about this last, this past week. Um, the Father put all things concerning this earth, this world, under Jesus Christ. And we found that we read that. We read that in Daniel chapter 7. And uh, mm -hmm. I keep going back to that it, that verse because it is so, so important. So it important. Is. Now I'm going to read it to you again because it is so important. If I, there we go. Mm -hmm. So just setting the stage once again for everyone. Um, Daniel is having a vision. He's having a vision. Okay. And this, and in this vision, he continued to observe in the night, and behold, one, like the Son of Man, was coming with clouds of heaven until he came to the Ancient of Days and approached him. Okay, one like the Son of Man. Who does Jesus keep referring as he, he refers to himself? Continually refers to himself as the Son of Man. Okay, the Son of Man. St. John's Gospel, we see a, a bright light there when he's talking to Nicodemus in chapter 3. He says, you know, no one has gone to heaven except he who descended from heaven. And I think he put a thumb in his chest and said, and that's the Son of Man. Quote oh, right there, okay? So, one like the Son of Man, the Son, the Logos, was coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, evidently, Jesus likes to travel in clouds because here he's coming in the clouds of heaven to the Father. Okay? He ascended from this earth on what? A cloud. Okay? And he's coming back on a cloud. <laughs> Watch those clouds. That's right. And... Um, so one like the Son of Man was coming with the clouds of heaven until he came to the Ancient of Days, the Father, and approached him. Then, 
dominion, honor, and the kingdom were given to him. And all peoples, all tribes, and all languages served him. His authority is an everlasting authority which shall not pass away, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Amen. So all peoples, all tribes, and all languages, everybody on this earth, okay, are in, under his dominion. Okay, it's the Son's dominion. Okay, and that was a gift from the Father to the Son. So, let me see here. Where are we here? So he has put all things under his feet. Okay. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. That would be, the exception would be the Father. Now, when all things are made subject to him, as we saw in Daniel, then the Son himself will also be subject to him, that is the Father, who put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for, this, for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in which... I want to go back here a little bit. Um, what is this? Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? There was an ancient custom, no longer done, okay, in the Christian faith. Um, let's say that my great-grandfather was not baptized. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. the first group of Christians want, oh, if you're not going to, can't get to heaven without being baptized, my great grandfather's not going to be baptized, wasn't baptized, so he's not going to heaven. So we'll baptize him now, after he's long dead. That's what's going on there. And so people believe this for a while. And um, the Mormons still practice that. Yeah, I think so. But uh, so why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Oh, I love that. And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Mm -hmm. We stand in jeopardy. We stand in danger every, every hour. In danger of what? Losing our salvation. We've got to be on tiptoes, <laughs> it seems like, every, every moment of our lives. Okay, so, ah, I affirm by the boasting and you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, and we have no record of that, by the way, where uh, St. Paul fought beasts in the uh, church in Ephesus. But, at any rate, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to the righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Amen. But some would say, how are the dead raised up? Let's go on. I, I, this is pretty good. How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Oh, yeah, I can't ask that question. Are we going to have real bodies at the resurrection? You know, and what will my body be like? And this is, they, Christians have been asking this question for 2,000 years. And here's an example of it. So um, St. Paul says, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? And St. Paul says, foolish one, foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. Okay. So, this is what this means. Yeah. 
think of our bodies, this, as being a seed, okay? Mm -hmm. a, a watermelon seed, or I ate, oh, remind me, my wife got watermelon. A watermelon seed, or a, a, a carrot seed, or you know, a seed. You put it in the ground. Okay, what comes out is not a, another seed. Out comes that watermelon. Right. Okay, much better than the seed. You know, you, I guess you could eat watermelon seeds, but I would rather have the watermelon itself. Okay, so what comes out will be much better than what you put into the ground. That's what he's talking about. And God's going to see fit whatever he, body he, he wants to give us. But it will be better than what we have now. Okay. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So we'll all be different. Okay? We'll all be different. But we'll get a better body than the one we have now, and God will choose what type of body it'll be. Okay? So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. This body, when they bury it, as uh, um, was it? Mary or Martha said uh, to Jesus when he said, remove the stone. But Lord, it's been four days. He stinketh. He stinketh. He stinketh. Well, that's corruption, okay? And um, the body is sown in corruption, and it is raised in incorruption. We'll receive a much better body, and one that will not rot away over time. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a living, a life-giving spirit. There's a note down there on that. Let's read it, 45. Whose body is this? As our present body is Adam, so the resurrection body is that of the last Adam, Christ. Okay. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man, Christ, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood, you and I in our present state, cannot go to heaven in our present physical state. We'll receive nope. something better later. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corrupt corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Amen. And, so when this corruptible has put on incorruptible, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 
O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Amen. So, nice, nice passage. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Yep. So, now I see uh, Joe Barbera is here with us and Arthur Bethea. Good evening to all and have a blessed Pascha. Mary Mary's Market, bright wheat, blessings to all. Amen. Yeah, I had a steak today, by the way. Sirloin. I got filled. Yeah, yeah. I got filled too. I, 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 we had a picnic at, at St. George's for Pascha, and it was one of those bring, bring your own dishes. And all our church has a lot of ethnicities, so every table had different dishes. And I, I was invited to a, a Greek uh, table. Uh, and we had lamb chops, oh. and we had dolmates, and we had tajiki sauce, and we had all sorts of good stuff there. Oh, now it was so there are some of us who are a certain age <laughs> who remember Sherry Lewis, yes, and little lamb chop. Yep. Okay. And what did you have for dinner? Or I had lamb chops. Yes, he, I did. He ate lamb I, chop. I did. I ate lamb chop. Yeah. Next on his menu will be Charlie McCarthy, I'll bet. Okay. No <laughs> and let me see here. Well, who else we got here? Karen Karlinovich is asking us to pray for those who died and were injured in Alabama. Also, those in Louisville. Katarina Salas, good evening. We pray for Katarina, Lord, and Anna. We pray for them. Have mercy. Maria Fenton. Looks like a lot of Greek to me there. Sharon Toby, say a prayer for me and my family. Lord, we pray for, for uh, my wife Sharon and all our family, Lord. We had a wonderful dinner tonight with my daughter-in-law and two of my grandkids. Beautiful dinner. I had steak. It was good. Jonathan Nichols says, praying. Wilson Salviejo, good evening, Wilson. And Wilson asked to pray for Kathleen. She had, I think she had pancreatic cancer that spread to her lungs. But she has cancer. We know that. And uh, Lord, we pray. We pray, dear Lord, for Kathleen, for healing. Amen. Our God is bigger than cancer. Well, Anna Gennaro, she joined you in eating lamb chop. Amen. She said, we had the, we had the same, Jonathan. We had a lamb on a spit at our uh, picnic. Cool. And she made tzatziki, whatever that is. It, it, it's a cream sauce. It's really good. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Delicious. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> And Joe Barbera says, lamb is my favorite dish. Jonathan. Mm. Yipper. Joe says, that was a good, that video was a good, concise breakdown of Holy Week. And I might show it next year on Palm Sunday. I may show it next year on Palm Sunday. It is. This was a recap this year. Next year we'll put, this is what's going to happen. That, that's a pretty good, pretty good video. So, all righty. Well, it's 9.58. You know what time it is? That's what time it is. So enlighten us, my friend. God loves you, and he really, really, really does. And that we love you, and we really, really, really do. Amen. And number three. Christ number is three. risen. Christ is risen. Uh from the dead. Indeed, he is risen. Amen. Amen. All righty. So, actually, Jonathan and I will see you tomorrow morning. Um, Robin has a doctor's appointment, so you and I tomorrow morning. And mm -hmm. then tomorrow night, we have the Actathus for those who have fallen asleep, who will be resurrected. Amen. Amen. So, folks, thanks for being with us this evening. Hope you enjoyed the program, maybe learned a little bit. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. So, until tomorrow, may God bless us all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good night, everyone. 
Good night, Steve. Good night, everyone. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord.